Hello, history enthusiasts. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving into a fascinating chapter of Irish, Canadian, and U.S. history, the Fenian Raids. So grab your passports because we're crossing the borders of Ireland, the U.S., and Canada to understand this fascinating and not very well-known piece of history. John O'Middle fulfilled his boyhood dream as he marshaled an 800-man army to the war front in the final hours of May 1866. The Celtic blood of the Irish-born soldiers coursed just a little quicker as they embarked on an expedition they hoped would ultimately result in the eviction of the British from their homeland after 700 years of foreign occupation. The governing passion of my life apart from my duty to my god is to be at the head of an Irish army battling against England for Ireland's rights, O'Neill declared. For this I live, and for this if necessary, I am willing to die. What's remarkable is that O'Neill's men did not march off to battle over the sod of Ireland, but through the cobbled streets of Buffalo, New York. The Irish-American army boarded barges and crossed the Niagara River to undertake one of the most outlandish missions in military history, to kidnap the British colony of Canada, hold it hostage and ransom it for Ireland's independence. In fact, the self-proclaimed Irish Republican Army attacked Canada not just once, but five times between 1866 and 1871 in what are collectively known as the Fenian Raids. This little-known coda to the U.S. Civil War was one more spasm of violence in that terrible conflict. In the centuries that followed the 1171 invasion by King Henry II's English forces, Ireland's occupiers had attempted to extinguish the island's religion, culture, and language. When the potato crop failed in the 1840s, resulting in one million people's deaths, some Irish were convinced that the British were trying to exterminate for the third time. A further one million people fled to the U.S. in one of the largest migrations seen in human history. Disease and death tore through the holds of the aptly nicknamed coffin ships that bore them across the Atlantic. Some emigrants reported that death was so common on the ocean passage that sharks stalked their ships, awaiting their next meals as corpses were tossed overboard. Those who fled to the United States in unprecedented numbers after the Great Hunger were unlike any newcomers the country had seen before. They were not immigrants in search of political or religious freedom, but refugees fleeing a humanitarian disaster. They hungered for food, not the American dream. They practiced an alien religion, Catholicism. 25% spoke Irish instead of English. They were desperately poor and sickly. Upon their arrival, the Irish faced the blistering scorn of anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant know-nothings. See the movie The Gangs of New York for more on this. The more threatened the Irish felt, the more they turned inward, like a snake coiling itself for protection. They had been able to survive seven centuries of attempted bridge colonization by refusing to be assimilated, and they would not only survive this, but they would thrive too. The Irish clung together in organizations such as the Fenian Brotherhood, an Irish Republican organization founded in 1858 that used the United States as a safe haven to plot rebellion in Ireland. While the Fenians could have simply devoted money to the cause of Ireland's liberation, some like John O'Neill arrived in America so radicalized by their experiences that they instead offered their blood. Like many of the Irish who fled to the United States, O'Neill witnessed unspeakable horrors during the famine times before coming to America as a teenager. He spent his childhood at his grandfather's knee listening to the heroic tales of 17th century ancestors who had the bravery to stand up and fight their occupiers. He joined tens of thousands of Irishmen who fought on both sides of the Civil War and saw their service in the bloody battles of Bull Run and Gettysburg as training for the real war they wanted to wage. But one to liberate Ireland, drawn by a plan to strike the British Empire at its closest point Canada rather than an ocean away, O'Neill joined the Fenian Brotherhood, which established its own Irish government in exile and had its own constitution, senate, president, and capitol building, dubbed the Fenian White House, in the heart of New York City's Union Square. A couple of side notes here, James Hoban, an Irishman designed the real White House in Washington, D.C. And John Philip Holland from Ireland designed and sold the first ever submarine to the Union in the U.S. Civil War. Even after living nearly 20 years in the U.S. and taking a Confederate bullet in defense of the Union during the Civil War, O'Neill considered himself an Irish-American in that order. Irish first and American second. With his soul permanently scorched with hatred of the British, the 32-year-old O'Neill led the Irish Republican Army across the international border south of Niagara Falls and announced their claim to Canada by hoisting an Irish flag to replace the Union Jack flying over historic Fort Erie. Using surplus weapons and ammunition that had been purchased from the U.S. government and smuggled into Buffalo, O'Neill's men emerged victorious at the Battle of Ridgeway. 
It marked the first triumph by an Irish army over forces of the British Empire since 1745. With his supply lines cut, O'Neill had to retreat back to the U.S. But not before Vowing returned to Canada soon. He would prove to be a man of his word. However, O'Neill's subsequent attacks in 1870 and 1871 failed. Still, he refused to heed the call of those urging Irish Americans to break out of their insularity and integrate into American culture. Instead, he sought to remove his brethren altogether to isolated colonies on the Great Plains. We could build up a young Ireland on the virgin prairies of Nebraska and there rear a monument more lasting than granite or marble to the Irish race in America," wrote O'Neill, who died at the age of 43 after transplanting several colonies in Nebraska. He was buried under the prairie soil 4,000 miles from his beloved homeland underneath a marker with the inscription, God Save Ireland. The Feet Mean raids owe their origin to Irish aspirations for independence. The Feet Means did not achieve this goal. However, the raids revealed shortfalls in the leadership, structure, and training of the Canadian militia. This led to reforms and improvements in these areas in the years to come. The threat the irregular Feeknean armies posed to British North America took place at a time of growing concern in British North America over the threat posed by American military and economic might. This confluence of events led to increased support among British and Canadian officials for Confederation. The end result was the formation of the Dominion of Canada in 1867. If you would like to find out more about this fascinating period and the events that took place, you can check out Christopher Klein's great book, When the Irish Invaded Canada. Don't forget to like, subscribe, until next time, God bless you, God bless your families, and bye for now.